Good evening. We're here in God's house, and that's a really good place to be right now. We're going to begin our worship service by singing. It is good to sing your praises. Number 513 in the Red Hymn Book. slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Let's come close to God and pray silently for his closeness and for his blessing on this service. Amen. 
our affirmation of faith is a response of reading. Do you have it on the screen there, Eric? Or no? Page nine, 697 in the red hymn book. 697. Coming straight from the Hadberg Catechism is question and answer 60. Number 697 in the red hymn book. I'll read the question. We'll respond together with the answer. Ah, oh, there it is. <clears throat> Dearly loved people of God, how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and of still being inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart. Turn over the page. We'll sing number 698. Your grace is enough. Holy Spirit's guidance. 
Father, we thank you for allowing us all to gather here this evening in your house, and we praise your name always. We ask that you allow us to be open to the words coming through from your words, and we ask that you lead us to not be distracted so that we can gain everything that we should possibly gain from your word and through the pastor speaking to us tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. <coughs> Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6, page uh, 1167. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Dearly loved people of God, if you were following along with the daily readings that got emailed out, you may remember that we used this passage earlier on this week. And I challenge you to read the passage and then to go back over it and pray through the passage. And I don't know if you've ever done that before, if you've ever worked with praying with Scripture, but I thought if you hadn't, this evening would be a good time to try something like that. So here we are all scattered throughout the whole sanctuary, and we're going to pray together, interspersed with me sort of looking at each of these phrases, or some of the phrases more in depth than some of the other ones, and working our way through this passage. So if you haven't closed your Bible, you're in good shape, and if you have, I suggest you pull it out again and take a look. What was that page? Number 611? 1160. 1160, I knew. Something like that. 1167. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Right off the bat, we get this instruction, this imperative, this command. Devote yourselves to prayer. It's a challenge for us to... Engage deeply in prayer. In this week's meditations, I compared that to being devoted to art or devoted to sport. Calvin, if you're going to throw down a bunch of free throws in a row, does that just come or do you have to practice and work at that? Oh, well, for some people, no, it doesn't just come. It's practice, right? You have to be devoted to this. Your sport has to be part of the thing that you do on a regular basis if you're going to get really good at it. It might be easier for some than for others. Just like praying and being devoted to prayer comes more easily to some personalities than to other personalities, but it's still a matter of being devoted, of, of engaging it, investing yourself in that so that it becomes something that comes naturally. So that in the heat of the moment, when you're standing on the free throw line, you can throw them down. So when in the heat of the moment, when it's the proper time to talk to God, that you're able to do that. And yeah, I don't know about you, but to confession, I find that really difficult, to be devoted to prayer. I know it's part of my job description. It rings in my ear every once in a while. When I was ordained, when I was installed, I was told, Harold, you have to be a man of prayer. And sometimes I do really spectacular at that, and other times it is much more work. I do it sometimes when I'm driving. I did that this afternoon going back and forth to Woodstock, more coming back from Woodstock because I was alone. And the opportunity to talk to God is there. 
and you start out with all great intentions and you think about different people that you're concerned about or different situations that you want to lift up to God and, and suddenly you're thinking about this or that and the other thing. And that's not bad, but it's not quite that investment in prayer that you kind of had hoped for about 10 minutes earlier. And so when I am devoting myself and spending that time in devotions and talking to God, sometimes I find it really easy or a lot easier if I put pen to paper and write out a prayer longhand, because then I'm forced to follow a word with the next word with the next word and to follow a train of thought, hopefully, somewhat clearly. Not that God's worried about clarity, it's more the, the posture and the, and the conversation with Him that He's worried about. When you're talking to a close friend or somebody you know really well, you don't always have to follow, finish your sentences or think clearly for them to get the gist of what you're talking about. In fact, sometimes they finish your sentences for you. So is this a challenging thing to be devoted to prayer? Is that something you wrestle with in your devotional life? To invest the time, the energy in that relationship and talking? It is for me. Let's talk about, to God about it. Heavenly Father, this is a great invitation and a challenging command and a cool encouragement for us to invest that time and energy and effort into talking to you. In some ways it seems so easy just to stop and converse with you, either quietly or aloud. And yet there's something in us that resists that dependence on you, and there's something in us that pulls us away from that. And so invite us again and challenge us and equip us be able to talk to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Being thank watchful and thankful. What comes to mind when you get this instruction to be um, devoting yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful? <coughs> this watchfulness sometimes gets referred to as watching for an answer to your prayer, but that's not really what, what Paul and Timothy have in mind when they're writing this. This watchfulness is more akin to keeping watch. It made me think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and his invitation for his disciples, Peter and John and James, saying, you're going to be tested. It's going to be difficult. Watch and pray with me that you don't fall into temptation. And so that invitation was, was there to stay awake and, and to be talking to God the Father on behalf of Jesus and on behalf of themselves so that they could stand, still, stand tall in their faith in this time of trial. And so here that watchfulness is encouraged again. <coughs> that unlike those disciples who fell asleep, we're being invited to be watchful and prepare ourselves for the time of Testing. I mean, that doesn't mean you can't get a good night's sleep. You have to stay awake all the time, obviously. But there's a time and a place for staying awake and staying alert and talking to God. And it strikes me that we as believers are being tested. We as a congregation are going through another period of testing in this year ahead. With some of the changes that go through, are going through. With some of the striving to become people after God's own heart. And then there's a appropriateness to be watchful in prayer asking God to keep our feet going in the right direction so that we don't stray off so that we don't go down the garden path but instead that we can be walking and serving and working together in ways that glorify and build up the church and so the invitation is there to keep watch and be thankful why is that included in there? Why is this invitation to, to be thankful in, in there? Is it because that's often one of our postures that, oh yeah, thank you God for this, and thank you God for that, and thank you for that? Well, maybe. There's an awful lot we've received and an awful lot we can be thankful for. But I think this is in the whole context of what we have received in big letters. This is the context of receiving everything in Jesus Christ. Of being dead in sins and transgressions. And now having life and hope 
and a future. And so our posture and our relationship with God is one of awareness of how well He's blessed us and what we've received. And so that's part of our conversation. We're aware of our context, aware of our, aware, aware of our identity and relationship with our Heavenly Father, with our Redeemer, and with the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Because if our life and our hope and our future and the resurrection of Christ was enough, we've also received food and clothing and shelter and most of us have meaningful work, education, health care, and a whole whack of other things. Let's talk to God again. Heavenly Father, watching and praying is difficult work sometimes. Sometimes it's, no, it's hard to know when it's time to to stay awake and spend a time of watchfulness and prayer. And sometimes we do get distracted or fall asleep like your earlier disciples. And so we pray that you alert us to times and seasons and help us to talk to you. You have done so much for us. We can't recount all that we've received from you. Ourselves our life, the forgiveness of sins. When we think of the doom that was in store for us and what we've been rescued from, it, it takes our breath away. And so we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the life and the hope and the future and all those other things that you've lavished on us, that we have enough and more and for that, we give you thanks. And we pray for the proper spirit of recognizing our dependence on you and on the people around us. And for you to create in us hearts that are thankful and that praise your holy name. Amen. And so there's Paul. And he's writing to these Colossians while he is in prison. And he is this apostle who's gone hither and yon, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's because of his ministry in Ephesus that people went out from there, particularly Epaphras, went out from Ephesus and went back home to Colossae and started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul considers these disciples that he's been able to help, that he considers this a church that he's been able to plant and yet instead of standing on his laurels and recognizing how powerful he has become in the young church and how much these young Christians have to thank him for, he makes them partners. He gives them a job to do. He says, you know what? I can't do this on my own. This whole gospel enterprise that I've given my life over to, I can't do it A, without God's help, so you talk to God on my behalf and, and pray for us that we can preach and proclaim this message properly as we should. And B, I can't do it without your help. Not that I need you to, to give a lot for my, well keep, or for my upkeep and well-being. Paul's not asking for that kind of a gift, not a material gift. He's asking these people to partner with him in prayer to support him and encourage him so that they're asking God that the Holy Spirit can guide his ministry. And he thinks it's amazing what options he has, what opportunities he has. He is in prison, and yet he says, though he's in chains himself, that God has opened this door for the, for the gospel to be proclaimed and for him to give this mystery of Christ to the people around him. If it is when he's under house arrest in Rome, which some people feel likely, we read in the end of the book of Acts that Paul was there in Rome in a rented house under chain and under guard and yet the Jewish leaders came in big numbers to come and talk to him and say, hey, we hear you're in trouble with the people back in Jerusalem. What's this all about? We didn't get any letters. We didn't hear anything about this. Tell us about this gospel. Wow, what an opportunity. And you can partner with me in helping me say the right things to these people. And you know what else? 
I appealed to Caesar, and my judge said, well, you appeal to Caesar. To Caesar, you're going to go. I'm going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in the highest court of the land. Pray that I can do that properly as I ought to. Pray that Timothy, who's partnering with me, and the other people that are around me as well, can also bring this gospel as the way they ought to. This is a partnership request. And saying, you know what? Humbly, I can't do this myself. I need God's help. I need your help. In order for this kingdom enterprise that we're on together to keep on going. It's bigger than just Paul. It's bigger than just any one of us. It's something that the people of God do together. The body of Christ does together. And he says, pray that I can proclaim it clearly as I should. Are you kidding me? Paul has been preaching this gospel for years and years and years and years. You think he knows how to do this? That he'd have this message pretty clear? And yet, sometimes there's stuff that gets in the way and distractions that get in there. And sometimes leaders get off track. And so again, he's asking for that help and support from God and from the people around that he can do this. And it's an invitation for people to pray for people who are in cross-cultural ministries. Because there's all sorts of barriers there to bringing the gospel and stuff in the culture and the community that some newcomer into that culture doesn't always understand. When I read this, I think of, the, of my friend and colleague, uh, Reverend Estevanas Bahago. I got to know Bahago when he was in Nigeria, Donga, Nigeria. He and I talked often while I was there in 1991. How many years ago was that? 24 years? That's quite a ways ago. But we've kept up a correspondence over the years. And now he is no longer in Nigeria. He's in Sierra Leone. Again, it's a cross-cultural experience. Yes, he's black African. And the people that he's ministering to, most of them are black African as well. But he comes from a certain tribe in a certain place and is being brought to a different tribe and to a different place, and there's barriers and obstacles for that ministry. And he's invited me and a whole whack of other people to do the same type of thing that Paul said, of praying that, that the door gets opened, that the gospel message can be proclaimed. And I love getting his monthly emails. He includes pictures and all sorts of stuff, and the gospel is going out powerfully in Sierra Leone. And people are responding. And baptisms are happening. Adult baptisms. And children's baptisms. And the kingdom of God advancing powerfully. And people are grasping hold of it. And it's really neat to watch from a distance. And so here again we pray. Those of us who are in leadership, the elders, the deacons, the pastor of our congregation, those who are engaged on the front lines of mission, and teaching we need that partnership with the whole body to pray that the gospel message can come out from this place that the community around us can hear and can respond and that we have boldness the time and the place to speak of it but we'll get there there's more to this passage but let's talk to God again Heavenly Father we're really thankful for your word that goes out powerfully and accomplishes exactly that which you have in mind for it. That promise from Isaiah 55 is extremely encouraging. And yet we humbly ask for your help. Because we're just normal people who put our pants on one leg at a time. There's no supermen or superwomen around here. And we are completely dependent on your leading and your guiding. Holy Spirit, we need you to prompt us for the time to speak and how to speak and how to do this so it glorifies you and builds up your people. And so we pray that we can be faithful in lifting each other up as we're engaged in this kingdom building process. We pray this not so that we look good or so that we can 
claim great fruitfulness in our own activities, but so that your kingdom comes, so that your will is done, and so that the church can go forward and many people can be added to our number daily, whether here or in Sierra Leone or Nigeria or wherever your gospel is being proclaimed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Paul sees extremely close continuity between the work that he's engaged in, in chains, in Rome, and the work that the people back in Colossae are doing day by day. And so he instructs them, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. You see, they're working as well on this Kingdom of God project. While they're going about their daily activities of harvesting or of selling or of tanning or whatever they're working on, they're part of this enterprise of building up the Kingdom of God. Completely related with what Paul is doing of proclaiming the Gospel. That's a bit of a challenging thing because the Christians in that culture were out of step with the local religions of each of their towns that they were in. And so there was a high place above Colossae where the temples were and the people who were part of the Tanner's Guild would go up there together at the right time to bring the right sacrifices so that the right gods blessed their work and it brought them prosperity. And there you are, as, an un, as a Christian tanner, and you're not participating any longer in these idolatrous activities that everybody else thinks is going to bring prosperity. Well, what's that all about? Don't you care about the prosperity of our city anymore? What's this whole thing about praying to this other God, the one that we've never heard of? You're not doing what we're supposed to do. And you're not even bowed down and, and claiming that Caesar is Lord. You're talking about this Christos as Lord. What's that about? Don't you care that we be this special place in the Roman Empire and that we have all the privileges and powers that, that come along with respecting Caesar as Lord? Come on, you're out of step with the rest of us. So how are you going to explain it now? How are you going to talk to your brothers in the Tanner's Guild? What do you mean you're not going up with us to do the usual thing that you've been doing for years? What's gotten into you? Well, wisely, respectfully, you give the reason for the hope that you have. In a conversation that's full of grace, you know what? I used to have that brokenness in me too, or I used to think that that was the best way to do things, but now I've come to realize that, and now I have seen the light, and this is where my hope and my comfort and assurance is, so that you can bear witness to the love that you've received in God from Jesus Christ. Give witness to the faithfulness you've experienced in God's covenant promises. See, Paul is inviting them and challenging them to be part of this mission that the whole church is engaged in and that he's engaged in even in chains. And says, come on, you get to do your part too. And it's not, hard, not easy, it's hard. And therefore, you have to be wise about this. You have to be gracious about this. Your conversation has to be filled with salt. What does that mean? Well, there's two ways you could take that. I mean, Jesus talks about being the salt of the earth, a preserving power, a tasteful power, something that's distinct and that adds flavor and benefit to, to the community around them. It's one sense you could take it in. One of the commentators that I looked at said that maybe this refers to a, a figure of speech that was used in those days about being wise in the way that you talked. And so instead of salty language being something that you didn't really want to engage in, the way we have in our culture, salty language was, was something wise and, and esteemed and, 
And that brought admiration in people. And so if your language is flavored with salt, you were worth listening to. And so that's what Paul is encouraging his partners in the kingdom of God, his partners in ministry, his partners in mission, encouraging them to, to do that. And he challenges them, well, know how to answer everyone. Be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you always may know how to answer everyone. That's still that idea of being a witness, right? Of making the most of every opportunity that you are given. Because there are opportunities that God gives us. The challenge that we have is knowing when to speak and when to be quiet. The challenge that we have is knowing what to say and what not to say. The challenge that we have is knowing when to be bold and when to be quiet. And we're not always sure on that. But in devoting ourselves to prayer and being dependent on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we will recognize those opportunities for what they are. And we'll be able to take them with a degree of boldness. And if we thought about it beforehand, about how we would talk about this gospel of Jesus Christ, of how we would explain what we believe, of how we would describe what we've received in Jesus Christ. Well, that's part of the mission, part of the ministry that we're partnering with Paul, that we're partnering with Jesus Christ that we're partnering with God, the Holy Spirit, in doing as we work together. So once again, let's go to God. Heavenly Father, it's hard to know sometimes how to explain what we believe, especially when somebody puts us on the spot, especially when it's a throwaway comment that they make, <coughs> to know when to respond and how to respond. It's tough sometimes. And so we pray that by devoting ourselves to prayer and of being in step with your Holy Spirit and of understanding our life as part of the kingdom building ministry that you've called us to do, that we can be prepared for these opportunities and have a word to say the right amount and not too much respectfully and kindly and gently, but also boldly, not apologizing for the faith that we have and for the firm ground that we're standing on. Because in you we have received life and hope and a future. And for that we give you abundant thanks and strive to live and talk in a way that brings praise and glory and honor to your name. <coughs> For you are our rock, our redeemer, our savior, our king, our Lord. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's, yeah, go ahead. May I have some food? You may, sure. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll be talking about prayer now. And uh, I'd, I'd like to go by our only experience. Mm -hmm. And I think most likely the... You mean when you first got married and, uh, together yeah, as a couple? Yeah. yeah. Four or seven years ago. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, I, I'm sure we prayed at the supper table and all that stuff, and the daily thing on the school and all that stuff. I, I don't think anything else really. And then I think, no, I mean, 10 years ago, maybe we, uh, we did uh, marriage for him, and then I think at that time too, we... We tried to pray together, and then we tried to find a spot, and you said, and we thought the best time was kind of do it before you go to sleep. We tried that, but we just kind of not place to, to pray in that. So, so I, it, it really didn't work. We did it for a while, but it, it really didn't work. And then, uh, yeah. Anyway, so we, uh, I have to uh, comment on Henny. Henny is kind of the prayer person. And, in our family, but anyway, like Henny had her, her personal prayers already for years and years and years. But um, like later on, when, uh, when the kids left the house, uh, one, at one time or another, we were sitting by the table, and uh, we were sitting across from each other after supper, 
and that seemed to be the best time for us to pray as a couple. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would uh, personally start holding each uh, other's hands, and we would have, and so far, uh, listen to us, conversation with God, and really go through the stuff that uh, we thank God for the day, and thank God for the food, and thank God for, uh, and for everything we have, kids, and health, and then, and then we kind of go over to the to the needs of the family or the needs of the neighborhood and, and, and the church. And uh, and then once in a while, what happens, let's say, it's a Monday night or so, we are a little bit late. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. We have to go sing or so, so I mean, we, six o'clock, we gotta go. Anyway, so then uh, suddenly the next day or so, we say, we say to each other, we didn't pray last night. And we kind of felt it. You notice the lack of it? Yeah. The lack Good. Now again, like we didn't do it, and yeah. we, 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 we have that habit now, and uh, yeah, I think uh, you have to find a spot where it works for you. I mean, it works for people if they get up early in the morning, let's say at 6 or 7 o'clock, and they, they want to spend their time at that time with God, I think that's the way to go. I think you have to find a, a particular time that works in your circumstances. That's all it is. Thanks for mentioning that. Any other thoughts or comments? Then let's sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. Number 898 in the Red Hymnal. We'll stand to sing. <coughs> Thank you. 
I got a text. I got a text. I got a text. 